Amen. Okay, so Proverbs chapter 29, and I just want to focus in on verse 15 for now. Proverbs 29 and verse 15, which reads, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And the title of my, my sermon today is The Christian Helicopter Parent. The Christian Helicopter Parent. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer before we continue. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for, for the great lessons you give us in the Bible, the great principles you give us, um, including, you know, practical advice and things such as parenting. Help me to, to preach this clearly now. Help me to preach it boldly, accurately. Help those to have attentive ears here and want to apply it to their lives. In Jesus' name, pray all of this. Amen. Okay, so we're in a world, aren't we, that seems to try to, it's best pretty much to separate children from their parents. Yeah, we see that all over and, and we as Christians should know better, shouldn't we? We should know better than to get, get pulled into the fads of this wicked world that we live in, the fads of the world when we're, we're constantly be, being told by the word of God to be separate, yeah, to come out from among them, be ye separate. But from very young, the encouragement to separate parents from their children comes in life, doesn't it? From, from the beginning with mums just being basically pushed and cajoled into going back to work. And, and whether or not that comes from, from the government sort of systems with free childcare, a uh, certain amount of free childcare hours which keeps going up and up to, to just, just people around mums, the, the, the worldly mums, when are you going back to work? What are you, when are you going to go back to your job? When are you going to be you? When are you going to blah, blah, blah? And, and they get this a lot, don't they, the, the mums out there, the free childcare hours, like I said, the, the, the nurseries that are being pushed for social interaction. Um, we, we used to get this a lot for, for people going, well, well, they need the social interaction at, at, at nursery. Like somehow a two-year-old running around with another snotty two-year-old is, is going to massively benefit them for their, for their you know, long life ahead of the workplace and being around adults. Because ultimately that's what we're training for them for, aren't we? We're training children to be successful to be well-rounded adults, right? But apparently being around a load of other two-year-olds is going to help them with that. Um, so you hear that sort of stuff about the social interaction. The mums get the, you need some you time, you know, when are you going to, when are you going to have your break? When it, and, and you get that in advertising, you see a lot of this sort of, you know, the mum having her time and everything else and the mums in their active wear ready to have, you know, their time and everything else. And look, don't get me wrong, some people do need some time off now and again, but it's pushed, isn't it? It's pushed, it's promoted. The, the school seems, seems to start younger and younger here, doesn't it? I mean, the, the teaching seems to start younger and younger. Uh, I think more recently they started pushing and promoting, you know, maths and English on sort of two or three-year-olds in nursery, and the nurseries need to start teaching them earlier and earlier. And it's not, it's not just the schools, is it? With school, you've got the preschool clubs, you've got the after-school clubs, you've got the holiday clubs, you've got the half-term clubs, you've got basically any sort of club you can to pull those kids away from their parents. For those parents to not have to look after their kids, for, for parents to be able to just palm them off, not just in the school hours, but also in the after-school hours, also in the weekend times and everything else. And it's just any which way they can try and separate kids, it seems, from their parents. Now, I, I, I was around this. We, we've, my eldest is 12 years old and we kind of had this pressure on us from early and many others have probably felt this pressure as well. It, it, it can even go as far as when they're at school to school trips, holidays, even school where they actually take away young children on holidays with maybe two or three adults or whatever parents, depending on the age, getting involved. But when you kind of take a step back from it all and look, it's nuts, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely nuts. But again, that's the world that we live in. And then even after school, even after school and kids making their own way to school, okay, that's a big, I mean, I remember when I was young, 10, 11, even younger than that, you know, time to make your own way to school. Get on the bus on your own. I mean, the wickedness that goes on out there. And there was constantly, at our school, you know, there were reports, suddenly the police would come in because something relatively wicked had happened. Some sort of weirdo had done this or that on this bus route or outside this park. I mean, just amazing, isn't it? Yet, still parents just get the bus, get the bus, get the bus, get on the train, walk your way to school, 11, 12-year-old kids that can't look after themselves. And then even after that, then you've got university. 
And that seemed to be, that was like a rite of passage. You didn't, you know, you weren't up for going to university. What sort of failure were you? And, and again, 18 years old children, yeah, children says the word of God, at 18 years old, just off on their own, living on their own. I mean, it used to be a running joke. I mean, they didn't know how to even cook a meal. They'd be eating cold tin beans and stuff when I was young. But, but apparently that was, a, you know, they needed to do that, didn't they? They needed to have a party, get drunk and do all sorts of wickedness for three years to somehow make it as an adult. Again, crazy, isn't it? Crazy when you look at it with our lens of the word of God on it. And, and look, I'm not trying to say we're all, we're all just so wise because a lot of people here would have been sucked into that had they not got saved and started getting in tune with what God thinks about life and, and these sort of subjects. But even when they're with their parents, so it's not just the whole school system and all the clubs and all the university and all the going out on their own, but even when they're with their parents, again, there's a push and, and an encouragement to plonk your child in front of the TV. Who's raising your kid then? The TV? Who, do you even know who those people are that are making those shows? Do you know who any of those people are? Do you know what any of their standards are? Do you know anything about what they're trying to push and promote in your kids? No. So then you've got the TV, you've got the iPad, the iPad and all the different games makers and, you know, all different video games, whatever you want to call them. Now, again, do you even know half the content of that stuff? The phones, how many kids are just on the phones, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of just videos, chats with people you don't even know who they are half the time, the social media. And then you've got this latest child-led fad as well. You know what I mean by the child-led fad. So this is sort of the, the latest thing where basically a child just knows best. So a kid just automatically, inherently knows what's best in life and you've just got to kind of encourage them to make that choice. So you just leave your, your baby, your toddler, they'll choose what to eat. They would apparently choose a healthy diet according to some of these people. They don't worry about them choking, leave it, you know, just leave them to it, yeah? Kids will just do it. And, and, and again, that kind of continues where you've got kids doing pretty unsafe stuff a lot of the time, just leave them to it. They know what's best and there's this sort of child-led learning, child-led everything. And again, this is one of the latest new age fads. Now, if all that pressure on a mum and a motherly instincts, and especially the mums here, but also on dads as well, but if all that pressure isn't enough, then you've got the psychological attack. And one of the more recent ones is you're a helicopter parent. Anyone heard this term before? Yeah, most of the room has heard the term you're a helicopter parent. Now, the connotation is that you're somehow hovering over your children. Okay, you're somehow some weird parent who even, who, who won't give their child space, who won't let their child learn for themselves. This is a sort of, this is what it is, it's an insult. It's an insult. But isn't that quite amazing? Isn't it amazing that being called a helicopter parent is actually an insult? Caring about your kids to actually want to know and, and keep them out of danger and be around them and not just leave them to it is actually an insult in this wicked world we live in. Now that's quite amazing, isn't it? And, uh, but for many of us here, it's kind of not because we live in a world where Isaiah 5.20 just seems to fit more and more. You don't have to turn there. And many people know this verse, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And woe unto them really because look at the result of that. Look at the result of everything just the opposite to how God teaches it through his word and look at the world doing all this weird opposite stuff and look at the result we see amongst the world, amongst the children growing up and everything else. Because a more fitting insult would be you don't care about your kids. Wouldn't that be a fitting insult? That would be, that'd be pretty insulting. If someone said to me, you don't care about your kids, uh, that for me would be a much bigger insult than someone saying, you're a helicopter parent. I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? Absolutely bizarre. I remember taking my, my kids to soft play areas when I was a bit younger and, um, and not so much anymore. And obviously kind of COVID stopped that. And, you know, some of the older kids maybe wouldn't enjoy it so much. So it doesn't really work so much now. But we used to take them there. And look, I don't think I've ever seen what the world describes as an actual helicopter parent, the connotation of someone who's just said, what I saw was a complete opposite. Out in the world, I saw 
mums having a coffee session and a tea session while their kids were smashing other kids around the head with things. I saw dads taking their kids, shoving them in this soft play area, turning around and looking on their phone for about an hour while that kid is, is causing mayhem, is, is you know, beating up younger children and everything else. And, and for me, it was, it was a pretty, pretty rough place to take your kids. You were kind of following them around. There's all these other kids who are just doing all sorts of crazy stuff and, no, and you're looking around, where's the parent? Where's the parent? And they're just completely disinterested. But apparently there's a lot of helicopter parents. I haven't seen many of these. Now, why am I preaching about this today? So why am I preaching about it then? Well, because we had a gang of wicked people in our church promoting this nonsense to our church members. So we had a large group in our church who were promoting the, ins the insult of being a helicopter parent and were trying to encourage the rest of our church and mums and families in our church to basically not care about their kids, to not be around their kids, to leave their kids alone, to not really want to be anywhere near them with fear of being called a helicopter parent. In fact, we were actually called helicopter parents behind our backs for caring about where our, where our kids were. And obviously the idea was to just constantly push and promote this sort of leaving your kids to it. And if you think about what eventually kind of was exposed over the last couple of weeks, it's even more wicked, isn't it? Isn't it wicked that you've got literal perverse stuff, yeah, going on in our church and people then promoting you to not care about where your kids are? Absolutely wicked. So... Yeah, something that was pushed and promoted. And the sad thing is, is that a little leaven does leaven us the whole lump, okay? And what does a lot of leaven do? When you have a lot of leaven, you end up with a mould problem, okay? You end up with a big, fat, stinking mould problem. And I want to make sure that we correct this mould problem that could have created in our church and was constantly being pushed. And I will, over the several weeks coming now and again, I'll be preaching on certain topics which I saw being pushed and promoted by wicked people in our church. Praise God, we don't have them here anymore. And yes, the Bible does teach helicopter parenting. Okay, the Bible does teach caring about your kids. The Bible does teach looking after your kids. The Bible does teach to have a close eye on your children. Proverbs 29, where you are, verse 15, says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Is bringing his mother to shame a good thing? Anyone want to be brought to shame? I don't want to be brought to shame. Yeah? And sometimes it's going to be unavoidable. We're going to be brought to shame at times in our life. But I don't think you sh your goal should be bringing yourself to shame. Mum's here. Well, leaving a child to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And a child left to himself is not a good thing, is it? Okay, the Bible's clear about that. That verse alone spells it out clearly. A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now turn to Psalm 46. Because who's the ultimate parenting example? Do we go to men and women of God in the Bible? Or do we go to the Lord God? We go to our Heavenly Father, don't we? The perfect father, the perfect parent. Well, did you know that he's a helicopter parent? Yeah, God's a helicopter parent. Fancy that. While you turn to Psalm 46, I'm going to read Psalm 121 verse 5, which says, The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. He's the shade upon your right hand. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Yeah, God doesn't just shut his eyes off to certain of his children. No, his eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And Psalm 46, where you've just turned, to verse 1 says, well, it's to the chief musician for the sons of Korah, a song upon Alamoth, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He's a very present help in trouble because he's always there. The Lord's always there. He's a very present help. And a helicopter parent, well, a parent should be there, shouldn't they? They should be there to help their child. And I want to help change the brainwash image of the helicopter parent, okay? Because it's used by our wicked world and sadly by people professing to be Christians as well as an insult. But I don't think it's an insult. I think that being a helicopter parent can be something you can wear with, as a badge with pride. And I mean that in a good way. Now here our helicopter father is called our refuge and strength. Now I want you instead, instead of picturing some panicky, hovering a millimetre away, rich guy's helicopter destined for a kind of high profile crash, because that's the sort of connotation like hovering out of 
control in high winds. When we think of a Christian helicopter parent made in his image, I think we should be thinking of maybe some sort of army helicopter. Maybe some, maybe you could say an attack helicopter, but I think we should be a bit more versatile. Let's think of a Chinook. Everyone know what a Chinook is? Yeah, okay, so a Chinook is, is quite a famous army helicopter. The RAF use them as well as the US Army, Navy, maybe as well, and Air Forces. Basically, it's a helicopter with the two propellers. So it's quite long, and they're very versatile helicopters. So they can, be mount, they can have mounted weapons on them as well. And sometimes, as Christian parents, we need to use some of our weapons to protect our kids, don't we, as well? But they can also lift heavy objects as well. Did you know that as well? They can, they can airlift people out of trouble. Sometimes we need to airlift our kids out of trouble, don't we? we as well they can they can provide provisions as well and sometimes we need to provide for our children as well so when you think of a helicopter parent I want you to think of some sort of Chinook or something similar okay something which is versatile something which is pretty cool as well <laughs> yeah something which you look at and you think yeah that 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 helicopter could do some could do some damage it could do some business it could do some good stuff right so have a little think about that Chinook. It can lift, it can transport, it can attack, it can protect. And turn to Psalm 91. The title of my sermon is a Christian helicopter parent. And number one, helicopter parents protect their kids. Helicopter parents protect their kids. And it's hard to protect your kids if you're nowhere near them, isn't it? If you're nowhere near, you've got no idea what's going on with your children, you're, you've got no idea what's happening, you can't really protect them. If you don't know where they are, you can't protect them, okay? You need to know where your kids are to be able to protect them. And kids need prote protection, don't they? Often, just from themselves. Often, the kids need protection just from themselves. Yeah, that's the truth of life, isn't it? But regardless of the fact that kids get themselves in a lot of grief and do a lot of foolish things sometimes, no offence, kids, but look, we were all there as well, and we all, look, some of us adults still do foolish things, all right? So at least you've got the excuse of being kids, okay? But... In the same hand, on the same hand as well, it is a wicked world out there, okay? Does anyone look around and walk out on the streets to see the people going past and, and think, yeah, you know, they're not so bad. I'll just let my kid just, just run around and play with those sorts of people. I don't need my kids nearby. And look, and the truth is, like I've said, and it's not to, to concern you. It's not to make you think, well, I don't really want to be there because you're commanded to be in church. Being in church is a great blessing. Having a real church is a great blessing. But just because you're in the house of God doesn't mean suddenly there's no wickedness. And we've obviously learned that recently more than ever. But look, there is wickedness everywhere, okay? You need to protect your children, okay? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah, pretty clear. When you look at a child and see a helpless child, even teenagers, even, even to the point where they get into their 20s sometimes, and you, look at, and, and you look at your offspring and you think, they still need help. They still need protection. They still need my guidance. They still need my, my support. They still need many things, don't they? Okay, and to, to, to get sucked into this, well, they'll be fine on their own, is madness, isn't it? It's folly. But it's at every angle, and because it's, be, it's at every angle outside the church, we need to make sure that it doesn't go on in the church as well, right? Okay, so you're in Psalm 91. Psalm 91 and verse 1. We're looking at our, our, our helicopter parent, God the Father here. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God, you helicopter parent, you. Under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Now that's basically the trap of the bird catcher, the snare of the fowler. Noisome is hurtful or destructive, pestilence is plague, disease. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So he wants to cover us to keep us under his wings. Huh? Gives images of a helicopter parent there, doesn't it? Verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. That's some protection there, isn't it? That's some protection that, that our God offers us. He didn't say, just deal with it yourself. You won't learn if you don't smash your head open. You, you won't learn if you don't shove your fingers in the plug sockets. No, he wants us to abide in him and then he'll look after us. And our kids need our protection too, don't they? Yeah, kids need our protection. 
look, there's so many hazards out there. Some are just obvious hazards and your kids need your protection. It should be obvious. But kids, you have to stay in formation as well, okay? Kids here, you, you have to make sure that you're, you're able and willing to be protected. Verse 1, he said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's, that's basically being under the shadow of him. That's choosing, choosing to have the protection of God, choosing to dwell in his shadow. Okay, and kids, you need to choose to dwell in your, in your parent's shadow because, look, however big and bad and tough and everything you might think you are, you haven't got a clue what's out there, okay? You, it's worse than you think. It's worse than you think. You might think, well, I listened to some pretty truthful preaching here. Look, we don't cover half the stuff that goes on out there, okay? Because it's so disgusting and it's so wicked what goes on in that world that we all live in. Okay, so your parents' job is to protect you. And that's from the household hazards to a one-year-old up, up to the psychological and sometimes physical as well hazards to an 18-plus-year-old. Okay, look. There, there, there are hazards everywhere and, and look, some of us have been through some of those hazards and we, we are wiser for it, yeah? And that's why we're there to protect you, that's why you're, you're, you're put under our protection, children. But like I said, how can we protect you if we're not nearby? How can we protect children if we're not nearby? Can you airlift that casualty if you're on a break somewhere with your feet up? as a helicopter pilot. You can't, can you? You need to be ready to spring into action. You can't fire the mounted machine gun turrets if you're several miles away, yeah? There's only, you need to be close enough to be able to do that, or you, you might even be, be hitting, you know, doing some friendly fire there. Well, verse eight says, only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. And there are a lot of wicked people around, aren't there? There are a lot of wicked people around, believe me. Verse 9 says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. The condition is making the Lord thy habitation, okay? If anyone reads this psalm and just thinks, oh, I'm saved, automatic. No, you need to make the Lord your habitation. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now, that's kind of like multiple helicopters, isn't it? So you kind of got the big Chinook and then you've got all the kind of attack craft nearby as well. And that kind of makes me think of siblings. It makes me think of, look, families. You, you need to be looking after your siblings as well because it's a hard enough job for parents. Sometimes they need those siblings to help as well. They need them to keep an eye out, to keep watch out. But also the church family as well. Okay, look, you're, we're, we're a big family here, right? And, I, and I've already noticed just in the last couple of weeks that family getting closer and tighter and stronger. And, and, but we should be looking out for each other, right? We should be looking out for each other's kids and everything else. And there's something I want to cover quickly with that because it's something as well that I notice being pushed a bit. So looking after, looking out for each other's kids is one thing. And, we, and of course, we don't need to be overly weird about people anywhere near our children in a church. So some people take this too far where someone says hi to their kids and they're like, well, uh, some sort of weirdo, you know, and everything else, okay? Okay, but on the, on the flip side, we did have this strange new kind of trend being pushed in our church recently of giving newborn babies to just men in the church to hold. Yeah, anyone notice that one going on? Okay, very odd, very odd, okay? And look, I'm not having a go at the men that were kind of, that had the newborn baby put in their hands and were like, okay, I'll hold your baby for you, thank you. But that's not normal, okay? Most mums don't really want a lot of the time, other mums to hold their babies, let alone random men in the church, okay? That's weird, and look, that's not a trend we're going to continue in the church, okay? So please don't think that if you kind of been a bit, kind of had your head turned by that and thought, yeah, yeah, I better find a man to give my precious newborn little baby to, which, by the way, if they don't hold them right, sometimes they can have injuries with their necks and things like that, but don't worry, you, you've never had babies. Here you go. You have had babies. Here, look. I don't want to hold other people's babies. And I'm sure most men here feel the same, yeah? It's odd, okay? So just, just, a, just a quick heads up on that, okay? That wasn't, that wasn't a normal thing to do. Okay, and, and what was that about? Probably to make you feel like you're just so close to them and everything else, and then it's harder when they eventually get the boot. Okay, so very odd. And it was part of this whole, you know, just, oh, I don't care. Hey, someone's got my baby. I don't care. I'm going to be, I'm just off having a chat and the baby I'm sure is fine. Yeah, weird. Right, let's carry on though. Verse 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. 
Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And that should be our goal as parents too. Ready to answer the call, right? They're in trouble. Helping them achieve long life, yeah? Okay, how you train your child is going to have a big effect on whether or not they make it to a good ripe old age, yeah? And it is basic parenting instincts, isn't it? Okay, it's basic and look, just, just wanting to protect your children. Is, is no, it, normal people just want to do that, don't they? And you kind of have to have it whipped and beaten out of you by this wicked world. Because the normal parent just has those instincts. If you notice, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. And the Bible talks about every subject we need to know about, right? But there are certain things that the Bible does it because so much of it is just instinctive, isn't it? Exactly what you do at the newborn stage and everything else is just instinctive, isn't it? And, and some of it, look, some of it is things that, that, you know, there's some leeway on, right? Okay, and you're going to learn from other people. And then the things which you need to know, like, for example, chastise your children and other things like that, the Bible will talk about, right? Okay, but it is basic parenting instincts. And look, I, just in, tw in 12 and a half, 12 and a half years of, She's shaking her head. Twelve and three quarter years nearly. Okay, sorry, nearly missed out on a couple of months there. Of, of parenting. I, I've lost count of the amount of times that we've, between my wife and myself, protected our kids from danger, it, from being nearby. And things that we wouldn't have done had we not been nearby. And whether that's being one of the only parents that stayed at some sort of sports club thing and actually bothered to stay and watch them, which you would think would be normal, wouldn't it? Like, I mean, it, it amazes me how many of these things, they're just like, drop your kids and, and go. It's like, who even are you dropping your kids with? Yeah, it's absolutely bizarre, isn't it? But from things like that to, to I mean, to serious, serious situations sometimes as well. I've lost count. I'm not even going to start relaying stories because this will turn into a five-hour sermon if I do, okay? But I'm sure every parent here could pretty much say the same. Could, and, and maybe everyone here could think of times when their parents, if they're not parents, think of times when their parents protected them from being nearby at the time, yeah? And we, look, I know you can't literally be hovering over them, it would be quite cool if you could, but you can't, but you know what? You should want to at least, where possible, be nearby your kids, right? And be able to protect them, be able to help them, be able to defend them against the wicked people around, be able to protect them from themselves sometimes as well. I mean, kids do some funny stuff sometimes, don't they? Okay, so, Go back to Proverbs 29 and verse 15. Like you know, the title of my sermon is The Christian Helicopter Parent. Number one, helicopter parents protect their kids. Number two, helicopter parents punish their kids. Helicopter parents punish their kids. Now, if that Christian parent is like an army Chinook protecting civilians, sometimes those civilians do do silly things, okay? They start wandering towards the enemy, don't they, sometimes? doing other dangerous things, right? They, 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 they do, and kids do that, don't they? Sometimes they need reproving with the loud hailer, yeah? Sometimes they need the water cannon out, and sometimes they even need the rubber bullets, yeah? And, and don't start picturing all these wicked governments of past. I'm sure there have been a couple that have done it here for good reason, right? Okay, sometimes they need that, and sometimes our kids do need punishing, don't they? Because there is this sort of, this picture of the, you know, again, the connotation of a helicopter parent is this sort of flustering mum who's just like, oh, little Johnny can never do anything wrong. You know, he's just so, so, these mean kids around him. But that's not the truth, is it? Again, it's just a, it's just a lie. It's a brainwash. A, a, a helicopter parent, a real parent, needs to know what's going on to be able to punish their kids, right? Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So part of that negative stereotype is that, that liberal mum who won't punish their child. But like I said, how are you going to know what, what behaviour needs punishing if you're not nearby? You can't know, can you? Now, if a child's left to themselves, there's going to be a load of unwise behaviour that's missed, isn't there? Okay, just, just take away from even the evil and wicked around them, just their own behaviour. Because like we said, that child-led thing is nonsense, yeah? Your kid wouldn't last a week on their own, well, even from a year old, two years, three years, the older they get, they might get into the two-week mark. Look, they're not going to last long, okay? And just themselves, you need to be there to correct that, don't you? 
because we're training them. Because as Proverbs 22.15 says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. That's what the rod and reproof are for, to drive away the foolishness and replace it with wisdom. That's our goal as parents, isn't it? We're, there, we're trying to drive out foolishness, we're trying to backfill with wisdom. And look, you'll, you'll also benefit from that, parents. So look at, look at verse 17 in Proverbs 29. It says, correct thy son and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. So you benefit from that. Turn to Proverbs 13. There's no point watching your kids and then turning a blind eye when the bad behaviour comes. And look, there are parents that do that. Okay, There are those that have a close eye on their kids, but when the bad behaviour comes, that's when they turn and look the other way. That's when they pretend to have missed it. Why do they do that? Because it's easier. Because it's easier not to punish sometimes, because some kids have tantrums when you do punish, don't they? Some kids don't deal with punishment that well. And some kids can be hard work when you start trying to punish them. And some parents decide, I'll just turn a blind eye there. But the Bible describes that as hating your child. Look at verse 24 in Proverbs 13. He that spareth his rod, rod this is Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times so the times is early before it's too late don't spare that rod of correction okay parents don't spare it you're not doing them any good and you'll suffer in the long run right god describes early okay in good time punishment as a loving thing to do doesn't he okay that's a loving thing to do and again our world gives us a different different impression of, of physical chastisement, doesn't it? That somehow that's a hateful thing to do. But it's actually a loving thing to do, and I, I'm going to trust God on this rather than, rather than the world, and I hope everyone else trusts God on this. Now, he says early, in good time. And because the world's version of love is completely the opposite. The world's version of love is just kind of cuddles and turning a blind eye to everything, but is that loving? I mean, if we, if, we, if we did that in this church, if we just turned a blind eye to every sort of wickedness and behaviour and just tried to get along and everything else, can you imagine how bad this church would be? Yeah, if I just didn't preach on anything that, that, that might affect people in this church, can you imagine the rampant sin that would be going on? Can you imagine what we'd still be dealing with in this church and ten times worse if I, if, if I wasn't constantly trying to fight against that? And, and look, I'm not saying I'm so loving, but that's what the Bible commands us to do, doesn't it? Yeah, some, some, sometimes love is calling out wickedness. Sometimes love is correcting. Sometimes love is punishing, isn't it? And sometimes love can be punishing with a punishment that actually matters, that actually is going to make a child think, no, I don't want to do that again. Okay. But you do need to remember when you're punishing your child, remember it's a punishment, not a way of letting off steam. Because then there's people that go too far on this, right? Turn to Proverbs 23. Some can take this too far. Now, Proverbs chapter 23 says in verse 13, Proverbs 23, 13, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, what's that about delivering his soul from hell? Well, a child has to understand repercussions for behaviour, don't they? And notice we're, we're chastising them betimes, that's early. Because they may, not, they may end up not believing there is such thing as hell if they never get punished or chastised for anything. Okay? A child has to understand that there are repercussions and then they're more likely to understand and believe the Word of God when the Word of God says, look, there's an eternal punishment for your sins. Right? Okay, that's why you deliver their soul from hell. But is this talking about beating them black or blue? Or black and blue or, you know, one of the two? Well... A beating as we would describe it nowadays because sometimes when you think of a beating you think about someone getting a real hiding don't you someone getting beaten up maybe ribs nose everything else no it's to strike it's measured punishment okay don't forget that it's measured punishment turn to Ephesians chapter 6 while you turn now, I'm going to read just a couple of places where we see about beating being prescribed. Acts 16, 22, and the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Okay, these are, these are people commanding a lawful, theoretically, beating here. 
Acts 18.17 says, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. Right, this is measured punishment. This is basically either a whipping or this is a, a, a beating with a rod. It's not beating someone up. It's prescribed punishment, yeah? Now, believe it or not, and, and, and God prescribed lashes for certain, for certain crimes and sins, that's more likely to put people off than caging them like an animal for however many months or years or anything else where they just hang around with other criminals and learn criminal activity and then come out with much less chance of getting a job or anything else, yeah? No, God's prescribed way was, and, and here, these aren't even God's people or God's nations, but they still thought that it was more effective to punish people there wrongfully, because he's punishing Christians for preaching the gospel, but regardless, with, with measured controlled punishment. A strike somewhere where it's going to give a sting, where it's going to hurt, but you're not going to give them lasting damage, right? It's not beating someone up. The point is that it's done in love, not hate. Ephesians 6 and verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and, that, and thou mayest live long on the earth, and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Notice how it's nurture and admonition, not cussing and savage thrashings, yeah? It's nurture and admonition. And that's what, we, that's what our goal is. Because there's a stereotype then that smacking your child's bottom is, is somehow what some evil, wicked, angry, you name the movies with anyone dishing out any corporal punishment as being some drunkard, some sort of angry, scary monster of a father that comes home or some sort of just angry, frustrated mother, again, usually combined with drinking or something else. But that's not how the Word of God describes it. But it should be done lovingly, right? And it's done, look, I'm not saying you have to be, it's not, it's not a stroke, yeah? It should be something that stings, but it shouldn't be leaving long-lasting damage. It should be something that, that basically makes a child think, yeah, I don't want to do that sort of behaviour. Look, you know, it's much more loving when your child tries to run across the road to, to, to grab them, pull them back, and give them a smack bottom so they know that trying to run across the road results in a sting and don't do that than it is to go, nah, little Johnny, you, you know you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> little Johnny thinks running across the road gets smiles and cuddles and, and everything else, right? Look, it's pretty basic, isn't it? It's pretty basic stuff, but again, the world just distorts it all, doesn't it? And that can be the same with anything in life, right? That can be the same with anything that's dangerous in life. A child needs to understand not to do that, and the Word of God it shows us how we should do that, but it's done in love. It's a loving thing to do. It's not because I'm just so angry with my child, I'm going to give them absolute hiding and get it out of my system, okay? That's what the world wants to paint it as. That's not, we don't want to prop up that stereotype. It's nurture and admonition. But, but sometimes kids do need strong punishment, but it should be measured, yeah? Okay, not, not, not some pounding. So go back to Proverbs 29. We look at the Christian helicopter parent. Number one, helicopter parents protect their kids. Number two, helicopter parents punish their kids. And number three, helicopter parents prioritise their kids. Helicopter parents prioritise their ki kids. If that Chinook keeps flying off and not doing its job, it's the pilot that's getting blamed, not the people on the ground, right? Yeah, if that Chinook was meant to provide air support and he just flies off somewhere else because he's a bit bored, doesn't really fancy it anymore, he's the one that's going to get the grief, yeah? You're not going to go, oh, those stupid people on the ground. Well, look, it, 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 let's, we're going to look at it just from a selfish point of view first. If you don't hover nearby to those kids, you're going to be getting the blame. They're going to be bringing their mum to shame, right? Look what it says, Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So you get what you put in. And those that put the least into their kids end up with the worst relationship. I've noticed that in life, that the parents that were never there of old school friends and things like that, the ones, especially, you know, if you ever came across those real rich kids that... that were sent off to some sort of boarding school or something else like that, usually they didn't even call their, their mums and dads mum and dad. Usually it was, you know, it was by first name or, you know, father, and it was always done with some sort of, not much love there, yeah? 
and, and that's just the truth. That's just a, a clear truth you can see in life. Those that just didn't bother, those that were just, yeah, whatever, the mums that were, you know, career mum and everything else, a lot of the time, most of the time, in fact, probably much all the time, you could see a massive difference in those relationships, couldn't you? Okay, and you can see that in life. So we don't want to leave our, our, our children to themselves. You get what you put in, right? And it can be very tempting to drop your kids off with so-and-so, okay? If you've got someone that you do trust and everything else, it can be tempting. I'm not saying, look, you've got to never, never be, you know, anywhere near them. Some people are blessed with family that they trust and that they, you know, and you can make that judgment and that decision. And sometimes that can be a useful thing, right? Okay, and sometimes that can be good, but you, you've got to watch out with that as well, okay? Because they won't raise them like you do. Look, the grandparents, a lot of the time, will not give out that measured punishment, will they? Okay? They won't prioritise your child's long-term, you know, development against just having that good time grandparent fun with them, okay? And that's, a, that's the truth. And look, sometimes they get, look, I'm not saying, right, that's it, got to ban the grandparents. Yeah, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is you've you got you to gotta get that right, that balance right with that, okay? Because they won't. They'll, they'll, they'll be getting ice creams when they should be getting a smack bottom, all right, with the grandparents a lot of the time, okay? So you want to watch out for that. But we should, we do, and we should be prioritising our children because it's a mother that's going to suffer in the long run. A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So there's another one that, that can be pushed as well that, that I saw being pushed was leaving the older child to look after all the younger children. Okay, that's, that's going to eventually bring the mother to shame. Now look, now and again, look, older kids can help out, okay? That's great. And, and sometimes you're going to get your older kids to help out with your younger kids. But literally getting them to do the parenting role for big parts of the day and everything else, that's basically leaving a child to themselves. In fact, that's leaving the older child to themselves, or even worse, yeah? And, and look, that's not going to be good in the long run, okay? Because is that, is that 11, 12-year-old wise? Is that 13, 14, 15-year-old wise? No. No, and they're not going to be doing the punishment. If they're giving out the punishments as well, that just gets weird, right? And, and ultimately, they're not going to be giving out the punishments. And then you're going to have this situation where they're claiming one thing, you don't know who to believe. No, it's madness. It's folly. Okay, don't get pulled into that sort of stuff. Okay, turn to Proverbs 22. Turn to Proverbs chapter 22. You're in Proverbs 29. Because what's our goal? Well, Proverbs 22 and verse 6 says... Train up a child in the way he should go, Proverbs 22, 6. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So we're training our kids for life. And as an adult, that can be for quite a long time, can't it? Yeah, I don't know. What's the average age for a man here? 70-odd now, is it, in this country? Yeah, ladies, maybe it's getting up to 80. I think it's maybe 70 and 75. Might be wrong there, but something around that, okay? Okay, well, for me, that's a good 50 years on average as an adult. That's a lot longer than time as a child, yeah? Okay, and I know some of you older ones are getting annoyed here with me talking about those under 20 being a child, but that's what I see in the Word of God, yeah? Okay, so for me, look, you know, we're not interested in, in this country, they were trying to make out like 16-year-olds were, were adults. No, they're not, they're children. They might be older children, but they're still children, okay? And, and look, we're training them for, for adulthood, okay? That's what, that's what our goal is as parents. And we're training them in the way they should go so when they're old, they don't depart from it. And that's a long time, isn't it? So having those relaxing afternoons whilst the kids are dumped in front of the brainwash box or the kids are dumped in front of who knows what sort of video game and what's going on in that game and everything else, might not seem so worth it when you think about that you're going to have a lifetime of possible shame, yeah? And look, I'm not saying that, right, they can never play a video game if you think that's all right. Look, some people want to make those lines and draw those lines. I'm not trying to go black and white with this, but what I am saying is, look, we should know what our kids are doing. We should know what our kids are getting taught by. We should know what's educating our children. We should know all of that because that's what the Bible calls us to do. Turn to Psalm 127. And look, what I am saying is some of that stuff is wicked, though. Okay, let's just make that clear. A lot of that stuff is wicked. Okay, a lot of what's being pushed on children is wicked. A lot of the cartoons, a lot of the, 
I mean, let's be honest, 99.9%, .9 if not 100% of what Disney pushes is wicked. Yeah, all these companies, all these firms, all these big multinational corporations teaching your kids through their movies, through their shows, through their cartoons, through their video games are wicked. Yeah, they're, they're, they're bad people. They're bad people and they have an agenda. Okay, there's no doubt about that. That's not, you know, I don't have to take off my tinfoil hat to preach this, okay? That's just clear as day. And, and, and the Bible's clear about that, who the God of this world is, and these people are all of this world. And they're pretty high up in this world as well. Okay, so look, you need to be aware of that stuff. Make sure you're aware of that stuff. But re regardless, regardless, when we talk about prioritising our kids, obviously we're not elevating them above God. Obviously not. God comes first. And we're not elevating them above our spouses. Remember not to do that either. Okay, your spouse comes first, yeah? But but we should be recognising their importance, their value to God. Look at Psalm 127 and verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Now, you could gloss over that verse there and think, oh, yeah, yeah, they're an heritage given to you by the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward to you. No, the fruit of the womb is his reward. His reward, not his reward to you, his reward for himself. They're an heritage of the Lord, an inheritance of his. They're his. They're the Lord's, yeah? You're looking after them for him. Yeah, Get, like, register that for a second. When you, when you have children, you're looking after those children for the Lord. You have to give them back to God. And now you might sit there going, no, no, brother Ian, I, I don't agree with the wording there. Okay, well... You want to get your kids saved, don't you? What happened when they got saved? Or when they do get saved? They got purchased, didn't they? With the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So either way, yeah, if you want to, oh, well, no, no, no. Well, either way, look, once they're saved, they're the Lord's. All right? But for me, when I read that verse there, lo, children and heritage of the Lord, the fruit of the womb is his reward. Not the fruit of the womb is your reward. Not the fruit of the womb is, is the parent's reward. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Talking about the Lord here colon after the Lord, okay? So for me, from young, yeah, they're the Lord's, right? Okay, they're, they're loaned to you by God. That's serious business, isn't it? If you think about it that way, that is serious business. Can you imagine then claiming to be a Christian and saying to someone <laughs> they're a helicopter parent because they don't just leave their kid with random people in the church? because they won't just, just leave their kid and go off soul winning with someone that they only met a year before, that they see once a week on a Sunday. Can you, like, that is wicked, isn't it? How wicked is that? When, when they're the Lord's children, and the, chil and the Lord says that they're his heritage, they're his reward. Think of someone really important in your life. Maybe your boss at work. Maybe your favourite relative, your favourite person in the world. Maybe not. Maybe the scariest person you know. Maybe the toughest guy in your town came up to you and said, I need you to look after my child for the day. What, are you just going to leave him with someone else? Are you, oh, yeah, whatever, yeah, just, just, just shove him off somewhere else. I don't even know where they are. Would you just start, get on the phone then and just, yeah, yeah, go and, go and do whatever you like, yeah? You wouldn't, would you? Would you, uh, you, you you're looking after them for the most important scariest, favourite, and he should be all of those, right? Yeah? Person in the world, and you bring them to church, and you're just like, yeah, I don't even know where they are. Yeah, who knows? Who cares? Everyone's all right here, aren't they? What could happen? What could happen in a church building? You wouldn't do that, would you? But, yeah, we're looking after our children for the Lord, yeah? For God Almighty... And how many people get pulled into that? Get pulled into that, well, they'd be all right. Well, whatever, look. We should take it seriously, shouldn't we? Okay, so I turn to Deuteronomy 6. Because it's not just keeping them out of trouble. It's not just keeping them safe. It's not just being ready to punish them. And that ultimately is keeping, keeping them out of trouble in the long run. Because it is prioritising them. And when you're doing that, you're preparing them for life. Because eventually... You know that helicopter parent can't always be there, okay? Eventually that helicopter won't always be there. As they get older, that helicopter has to hover that little bit further away, doesn't it, sometimes? There are areas that helicopter can't get into. There are, there are places of deep cover that those kids end up getting into, aren't there? And, and there are areas where, you know, that helicopter can't, can't get. 
okay? And, and as, they get, as they get to the point where they leave your home and everything else, well, you're not going to be, if you are hovering nearby, that is going to be a bit weird bit. All right? So if you're hovering over your sort of 30-year-old and, you know, and kind of, okay, that, that might be a little bit strange. And, so, and maybe then you could, you could be criticised for that. But Deuteronomy chapter 6 and from verse 4 says... Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Sounds like he expects us to be pretty hands-on with our kids, right? Yeah? Uh, that's pretty hands-on. That could be a helicopter parent, couldn't it? You can't do that when you don't know where they are, what they're doing, can you? You can't talk about the, the words that God commands us diligently to your children when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, if you're nowhere near them, can you? And that's prioritising your kids, isn't it? Okay, that's preparing them for life. Prioritising your kids that really are God's kids, yeah? So, the point of this sermon is, look, don't let these wicked people shame you. Look, it's expected on the outside, it's sad when you get it on the inside, okay? Don't let them shame you. It's those without natural affection that should be shamed, okay? Those without natural affection are the ones that should be shamed. Don't let them shame you, okay? We should care about our kids. We should want to know where our kids are. We should protect our kids. There's nothing wrong with that. You'll keep getting this attack from the world, okay? Be strong about it, yeah? When you get it from the unsaved family, when you get it, sadly, even from the saved family, when you get it from, from the friends, when you get the people that are trying to constantly encourage you to just not give a damn, to shove your kids off, to do whatever, don't, don't let them, yeah? Answer them. Stand strong and say, but they're my kids. We love our kids, don't we? We want what's best for our kids, and ultimately, they're God's kids, okay? And we should protect those kids. So if you're a Christian and a parent, and you better be a, a helicopter parent. Number one, helicopter parents protect their kids. Number two, helicopter parents punish their kids. And number three, helicopter parents prioritise their kids. And let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer to finish up. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for, for you know, the, the clear instruction you give us in Scripture, for the importance you put upon our children. For, for how you want us to, to behave, for how you want us to follow your example as a loving parent, a loving father that's there in times of trouble, that's a present help in times of trouble, that, that's a shade upon our right hand, that a, 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 a parent that is just always there, always ready to protect us, to help us, um, to guide us, to look after us and that, that you prioritise us, that you, you, you want what's best for us. And, you know, for us, we don't deserve anything. And help us be like that with, our, with especially, you know, our innocent little children as they're born and, and obviously as they get older as well. And, and just knowing that, that they're in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is your reward. Help us to look after our kids. Help us to prioritise our kids. Help us to protect our kids. Help us to, to, to also punish our kids. Help us to, to do all these things as you'd want us to do them help us to um to do that from from today going forwards and help us to just to to not be swayed by the attacks on that by the wicked people around us in jesus name we pray all of this amen